Welcome to Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and students with mental illnesses to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Welcome to Resilient Minds 365, where we discuss the resilient stories of entrepreneurs, professionals, and and students with mental illnesses to encourage you to strive, thrive, and live in abundance. I'm your host, Cleone Crawford. Well, guys, today we have a special guest with us today. We have Ron Blake with us today. Who is Ron Blake? Well, Ron Blake was born and raised in suburban Chicago, Graduating with an MPA from Indiana University, Blake has become known, especially in the central Phoenix neighborhood, as the art, as that artist with the boards. His medium, his medium is the human interaction he's had each day for 2,846 days meaning 32,441 complete strangers one by one across the U.S. and Mexico. Those interactions are expressed as social practice artwork, contributions by those strangers in 94 94 languages with 27 Sharpie marker colors are on 498 giant foam boards and dozens of smaller ones. Blake, had a moment of laughter on a suicidal night that started this artistic journey. Realizing hope in an unlikely spot, he was nominated for and gave a TEDx talk about the evolution of his creative journey. Additionally, the artist has written more than 200 short stories, opinion editorials, and letters to the editor for a multitude of multi, multitude of publications. Many of those pieces have used Blake's creative recovery odyssey as a muse for entertaining and informing his readers. With that said, now that I've gone through his bio, <laughs> I will now introduce you to Ron Blake. How are you doing, Ron? I am good, Cleone. Uh, that's a lot that you just said about me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes, we got that part out of the way. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm here to share. Hopefully, what I share too um, is going to be impactful. Sometimes I've gone to to presentations at places, and I feel like somebody's just talking to me. Um, the hope is that that people that are listening are going to be able to take something away, um, because I think that's the whole purpose of life. If if it's just if we're only listening to other people's stories and it's not going to be meaningful in our lives, then it's no good. So the hope is that there, even if there are just one or two things that somebody can take away from this, that makes them excited, maybe it informs them, maybe it inspires them. That's the hope. Um, Because again, I mean, my journey over the last eight years has been about interaction with human beings. And that's, that's what's gotten me through an absolutely dark and horrible time of my life. This, the human interactions. Right. Definitely. So tell us a little bit more about your profession, about what you do, how you got started, and yeah. Well, and um, and there was something, just a horrific trauma that I went through that has just opened up a lot of doors in the most unexpected way. Um, so I'll start with the trauma um, that I went through, because otherwise nothing else is going to make sense. That That is the foundation for what brought me to where I'm at today. Um, this was about 12 years ago, right before Christmas. I was in bed sleeping in my loft in downtown Phoenix. And that night, three men came into my home. I was held down. I was beaten. I was raped. Um, it got worse. The um, I made a 911 call in the middle of all that. Uh, I have no idea. Like sometimes people ask me, how can you do that? When you're fighting for your life sometimes you'll never know the adrenaline kicks in but there there is even a transcript the 911 dispatcher heard the rape live uh she wrote about it but the the second wave of the trauma 
was the police response. Um, when they arrived, they um, they categorically dismissed the rape. And later on, um, officials with the Phoenix police, a lieutenant commander met with me in a formal meeting with a major organization and said, we apologize. Uh, this was a few years ago. They finally sat down and said, we apologize. It, it is clear to us that the four responding officers that night treated you differently because you are a gay man. Uh, and that, it, it just, it, 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 it was, as I call it, the second wave of the trauma because I did nothing wrong. I I told them what happened and it was just dismissed. And so that stays with you. Um, shortly after that, I'll never know the exact moment, but there was um, the doctors finally had diagnosed me also with dissociative amnesia, which I don't know if a lot of people know what it is, but actually I think a lot of people have heard of it without knowing it. Um, dissociative amnesia, it only happens to about 1% of all males in a lifetime. And it, it's, it's people that have been, gone through a severe trauma and you just have, as the word amnesia, you just have no memory. And for almost three years, strangely, I had no memory of the rape. I had no memory of what took place that night. And, and when I said earlier, I think a lot of people, Cleone, they, they know about it without knowing about it. Those movies with Matt Damon, they were called like the Born Identity, the Born Ultimatum. There were like four of them. They were very popular, but the whole basis for those movies was the character, Matt Damon's character. He had dissociative amnesia. He didn't know what happened to him. And so it was very traumatic for him. He was trying throughout all those movies to find out truly who he was and what happened to him. And that's what I went through for several years. And then there was finally a trigger um, several years after that night, and it started opening up memories for me. And I started remembering, and to this day, I can remember almost every detail of what happened, which aligns perfectly with the police report that night. It aligns, it aligns with everything. And um, But anyway, that was the trauma, uh, the two waves of it. And for the longest, and I had a lot of injuries. I never knew what the injuries were caused by. I had to have surgery. I had to have extensive physical therapy, PTSD counseling. I, I began having a lot of problems with opioids after that, but I never truly knew what the cause of all that pain was. It was just, it, it's a, <laughs> like when you look at that, those Bourne movies with Matt Damon you know, he was in a lot of pain, but he didn't know where that pain was coming from. And it was the same thing with me. So um, uh, finally, there was a moment, um, November 2nd of 2015, I woke up from a nightmare. And on that night, I, I had been going through so many nightmares over and over and over. And on that night, when I woke up, um, I was going to take my life. I got all the pills out. And sometimes when I do presentations, let's say for an audience, and I, I share uh, at a mental health care conference, sometimes people ask, you know, they'll say, you know, you're you're an educated guy, you're a vibrant guy, why would you want to kill yourself? Right. Well, and Cleone, I'm glad they asked that because it gives me a chance to clarify for all of us that have been in that position. Yes. We don't want to die we want the pain to stop exactly and there's a big difference and so um and yeah because i will get people that said oh because i identify as catholic and people will say what well, you believe you're a believer <laughs> you know you're catholic but again when you're in that much pain if people haven't been there they can't they shouldn't comment on that so that night when i woke up from that nightmare i just i said i can't do this anymore and for some reason, the television timer, the, I, I always would set it every night and it would help me try to go to sleep. For some reason, the TV was on and that timer malfunctioned. It's the only time that that TV timer malfunctioned. And there was a comedy show on. It's called The Late Show of Stephen Colbert. Right. And for whatever reason, something made me laugh. And it was confusing because I thought, am I still in this nightmare? Because why is this TV on? It didn't make any sense. but. I realized I was actually awake and I had these pills on my lap and I'm laughing. And that laughter is what stopped me from suicide at 1044 
p.m. that night. And I sat there for a while and I thought, I didn't know if this was a higher power, if it was the universe, is this karma in some way coming to help me? But whatever it was, I said, I'm going to get on this television show some night. I'm going to tell my story. And here I am with you, Cleone, and and people that are listening to you and us. Um, I'm telling my story. Amazing. So I see when I was reading your um, your bio, you mentioned that you, I guess you do social practice artwork. Tell us more about what that is. What is that? Yes, that's, <laughs> sometimes I feel like I'm a, an outlier in the art world too. And <laughs> artists usually are pretty much, um, we're a different breed, but I even like, I'm an outlier, even in, with the outliers. Um, yeah, that and that began with that night when I laughed and I said, I'm getting on this show. Um, yeah, Cleone, I said um, the next day after I woke up after that night, I had all that hope and I thought, well, how do I get on this show? How do I tell my story? Is is it, <laughs> is the universe, is a higher power going to reveal to me, I guess you could say, how do I get there? How do I get on the show in New York City? And I went to a Staples store and I thought, well, I'm still alive. I need paper for my printer. So I went to go get paper. And when I was at that Staples store, something caught my eye. I saw these giant foam boards, the kind that you had, you know, when you're in middle school and had to do a project uh, for science. <laughs> so I, I saw these boards and I just stood in front of them for a while, so I sort of captivated. And a woman came up to me and said, Hey, sir, can I help you? And I remember I just looked at her and said, do you have more of these in the warehouse in the back? And she said, let me go check. And she went around and then she turned back and looked at me and said, hey, how many of these do you want? Well, I never said I wanted any. I guess I was just curious. Does she have 10 of them? Does she have like 100? Because I was trying to picture, you know, maybe what a lot of them look like. And I just said, you know what? Whatever you have back there, just give me all of them. And she did. She came out. She gave me all of them. And then I had this mindset like, I'm going to use these. I'm going to go out and meet strangers. And I'm going to get some Sharpie markers <laughs> and, and I'm going to learn how to not isolate anymore. Cause after my trauma and the diagnosis, not just with dissociative amnesia, but with PTSD, I had isolated yeah. and I didn't want to be around human beings anymore. So I said, I'm going to go out every day. I'm going to meet strangers. I'm going to learn to talk about the trauma and I'm going to tell them my name is Blake. And I want to get on the late show with Stephen Colbert. Can I share my story? And that's how this social practice artwork began. And just the medium, as you stated earlier, the medium of this artwork is just human interaction. Um, and now for, gosh, I, we're, I'm on day 2,859 in a row where I just go out every day and I talk to strangers. And so they have written stories of support for my efforts to recover and to get on the show. Um, they've signed, as you said, almost 500 giant foam boards, just tens of thousands of stories. Um, and that's how it began. And that is what social practice artwork is. So is it like where people, they just, they write on the boards for you? They do. And, um, uh, Cleone, I, I thought initially, I thought, well, people will just sign the boards with their name because mm -hmm. then it would prove it would prove a couple things. One, that I had gotten out of the house. And two, <laughs> it would prove that I spoke with somebody because if they're signing it, it means they're acknowledging I talked with them. Um, and then I guess the third thing was when I would come home every night, I could see these boards and I could see like, I would see all these names and I'd think, oh my gosh, I accomplished so many things today. Um, that was important. And then as time went on, well, on the first day, somebody said, well, can I just, I, I don't want to just put my name. Can I add a message? And I said, sure, it's your board. Do whatever you want. And that was the start of it. People just started putting poetry. They started putting artwork. They put Bible verses. They put, I had a bunch of students put like math equations on there, but they turned them into like a story. It was so cool. I'd have to find it someday, but the, they were all like engineering students and it's um, people do whatever they want. It's their board. 
Okay. That's very interesting and very cool. I love it. I love yeah. it. Okay. So um, you kind of went into the mental health piece of the interview. So when exactly were you diagnosed with your um, illness on the selective is it selective um, amnesia? Oh, um, uh, dissociative amnesia. Disso dissociative, right. Yeah, and I, I I, will never be able to, I was actually talking with my mental health care team and the team I have now is different than what I had about nine years ago. And part of that is because I had changed insurance companies. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be able to find the initial diagnosis, you know, who had, because they our mental health care counselors, the ones of us that have had them, uh, I believe those records are destroyed every seven years, unless you specifically ask for them to be saved. So I'll never maybe be able to tell the exact day of the diagnosis, but I can put it at, it was somewhere around the summer of 2014. Um, it could have been in 2015 early. So somewhere around there is when they diagnosed me with PTSD and dissociative amnesia. Um, and it just, it started... It, it's I, I think for people listening, it's so important though, when you do get diagnosed, if if you are diagnosed, because then, you know, if you don't know what you have, you can't treat it. You can't start working on it. And I think that's powerful. It's like somebody that sits around and they tell their wife or their kids or their spouse, um, hey, I I have a pain in my side. But if you never go to the doctor and find out what that is, well, it could be cancer. And until you find out what that is, you're not going to be able to get better. And so with me and any of us that have that have struggled with mental health care, um, it's it's sometimes very powerful when we get that diagnosis or diagnoses because then we can start we can start working on it. We can start getting better. Okay. So let's say you do get on the not I'm sorry, not let's say when. <laughs> You get on the Stephen Colbert show. What are you going to say? What do you? What's the first thing you want to tell him? Oh, uh, honestly, I told um, I told all my friends, all my family. I've told people that have asked me that before. I don't know, and I I am just going to let the moment happen um, okay. because. Because I, I think the beauty of it is I just sort of want to enjoy the moment when it hits me. So, um, yeah, I, I know to some people it sounds strange that I've never, you know, here I've, I've spent 22,000 hours to get on a TV show for five minutes. And <laughs> it's not that I haven't given thought to what I would say. It's just I don't, I don't want to know what I'm going to say. Because I think the beauty of, like, even me and you right now, we're engaging each other. There's such a beauty. Um, because I had some ideas, you know, of what you might ask me, but sometimes the moment just dictates itself. And, um, and I think that's why trauma is so hard for all of us is because we live, we, <laughs> we pretty much know what's going to happen on any given day. We go to work. A lot of us, we might work, let's say a nine to five job or eight to four. Mm -hmm. We know we have to have reports due on certain days. We know. You know, we have to be to work at a certain time, but when trauma happens, there's no schedule. It just hits. And, you know, like we're coming upon the 9-11 anniversary from 2001, 22 years ago, when those people were in the towers in New York City, they had no idea what was going to happen. And I think that's why when I get on Stephen Colbert, I want to just embrace the spontaneity because sometimes spontaneity can be so destructive as it was on 9-11. But there can be spontaneity that's so beautiful, like when I get on Stephen Colbert. Yes, definitely. Cool. All right. So what did you have to do to overcome or bounce back from your lowest points? List all the resources. Other than I understand we had the, your social um, practice artwork. That was a big part of you bouncing back from the trauma of the rape. Right. Is there anything else that, um, that you had to do to bounce back? I did. Um, two other really important things for me. I've been a runner for a lot of years. Mm. I know that sounds quite painful for a lot of people listening. <laughs> people don't always like to run, <laughs> even if they're in sports. Um, if they're in basketball or volleyball or swimming, 
sometimes they have to do running as part of their cross training. And a lot of people dread it, but running for me, I've done it for probably 39 years now. Um, mm. And it, my running and my writing have helped me beyond the social practice art where they've helped me the most get through the struggles I've had and the challenges with mental health care. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've run, I haven't run any marathons recently, but I've, I've done them in the past, but I'm, you know, back to running again. I did have, I actually had a surgery last September. Um, well, actually it was a year ago today. I had a surgery to reattach part of my hip and it took all those years after the trauma. It, this happened that night of the trauma. It set in motion um, a lot of problems with my hip and my leg. So I had to have part of my hip reattached a year ago today. And here I am, I'm running 20 miles a week. And so that is so important to my recovery because, well, first of all, this is what they did to me that night. And I can run again. I can do what I like. But it's when I go out and run, I may not be able to change the world. Right. But when I go for a run outside, I control that. I I, I decide where I'm going to run, I how long I'm going to run. And so there's that's been helpful. And then my writing, I've written for, I think it's 18 years now for a lot of those publications around the country. Um, even sometimes I've written for like the Chicago Tribune. Um, I submitted something for them and they published it, I think it was two years ago. Um, a lot of them are smaller publications, like more boutique, but I still write. And like, what's exciting is by next Saturday, I have to come up with a Halloween story for my editors and I'm all excited because I love Halloween. Um, <laughs> so, and, and they're only about 700 words. Um, they're short stories and usually they're all true stories. So when I write like my Halloween stories, most of them are true stories. Um, so there's a beauty to that. So those two things, the writing and running have been incredibly beneficial for me okay cool so what are three things you wish you had available when you were you were at your lowest point three things um and i wish i had available i could just tell you one thing um at my lowest point because the lowest point was really when i wasn't talking about this i just it's it's like the Matt Damon character in the Jason Bourne movies. I just wanted the ability to remember. Yeah. I didn't. It's really hard when people are in the dark. Um, and some of your listeners will probably relate to this right now that some of them might have gone through what I did with the dissociative amnesia. Some of them might have had repressed memories. When you don't remember or you're unsure or somebody's been gaslighting you where they tell you it's very manipulative, the the technique, but they tell you, oh, no, I did not abuse you. I did not hurt you. I did not do this to you. But you know they did it, but you start doubting yourself. The, as I said, I would narrow it down from three things to one thing. At my lowest point, I just wish I could remember because I was in – it's just – it's horrible for me. It was horrible for me to be in the dark, and you just don't know why. It's like being in this black hole and you feel like you're yelling and you're screaming and asking for somebody for help, but the power of that black hole, nothing escapes it. You know, the gravity, the gravitational pull is so hard. And that's what I felt like. I was in this abyss, this black hole, and I'm screaming and I'm just saying, why? Like what, what has happened to me? And no one can hear me. And I, in some ways... It's, it's like almost I can't hear myself because a part of myself is hiding in your brain what has happened to you. And it's not to do it later on. The doctor said it's it, it's a protective measure because you might not be able to be prepared for what has happened to you. So, um, yeah, just the ability to remember would have been very powerful for those three years. OK. All right. Cool. So what words of hope can you give to our listeners? What would you tell them for someone who's gone through what you've gone through? And what would you tell them? To take the weight off your shoulders. Uh, once you tell somebody what your struggle is, it, it could be one, just one person. Because now that you've shared that, whether sometimes the people think it has to be a spouse, a sibling, um, your children, to be honest, it could be somebody that you work with. It could be a neighbor. 
it could actually be somebody that you see every day at the coffee shop you know and you just you guys always say hi and have pleasantries and you know you 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 talk over coffee for a couple minutes before you start your day i've heard people say like they they haven't gone to somebody super close to them they've gone to that person at the coffee shop because this and again this may sound unbelievable to people but what i've actually learned from different professionals is people have a tendency not to tell people very close to them what they've been through because they feel they're going to be judged and they're not wanting to be vulnerable. So when you tell maybe that one person what you've been through, your struggle, um, it might surprise people that it might be somebody that it might not be the family or close friend. It might be that person at the coffee shop because you guys don't judge each other. Um, so yeah, once you tell somebody, it's like now you started, it's starting the healing because now it's not just you that knows about what happened to you. It's somebody else. And then they can say, hey, you know, let me see what we can do together. Let's, I'm here for you. Um, that would be my one bit of advice to start with that person. Okay, cool. So now we're going to take a little switch in the interview. As you can see behind me, there's a book that says the music of my life. Um, the book is basically about my journey with mental health and bipolar disorder. So with that said, I want to ask you a question. What type of music do you like? Music. And it would depend, Cleone, it depends for me on the moment. Um, like I have to do, <laughs> in the next week, I have to write that Halloween story. So it just, and I think sometimes people might expect me to want to listen to like scary music, but I could listen to something super happy and write a Halloween story. <laughs> so it's really <laughs> going to depend on my mood um, before I go to the gym later today or do the physical therapy. Um, it just really depends. Uh, gosh, I mean, there's a song by, I think it's The Sun is Always Shining. I'd have to look it up on my YouTube, but there's there's a particular song. I think it's in Grosso or at Grosso. I don't know. I could find it, but it has something to do with The Sun is Always Shining. And it's a really sort of a it's a very upbeat song so sometimes i listen to songs over and over and over because it puts me where i need to be and uh, boom. yeah and uh, yeah and and um and i'll listen to classical music i can listen to yeah i could name a lot of genres but <laughs> it's just very particular to that very very moment for me okay cool all right. So how can we stay in touch with you and what are your social media handles? Well, if people go to Instagram, if you went to Blake Late Show, just B-L-A-K-E, Blake Late Show, there's a lot that comes up. A lot of photos that you can see um, and the videos. I did a lot of short videos. I'm going to start posting more on Instagram because I haven't, it seems like once the pandemic hit, I didn't post as much. But when you go back, I think that's where people can find something that they can take away because you, there are about 4,600 people that jumped into photos with me. We hold up the boards and you get to see all these people that I've met from Boston to Miami to DC, Wyoming, Southern California, Texas, everywhere, Chicago. And I wouldn't be shocked if there's somebody listening right now to, to us, um, where they look at somebody in the photo with me and say, I know that person. Mm. Because, you know, when you have 4,600 people in photos with you, we're going to be connected somehow, some way. And again, I've met people all over this country. So I would actually ask somebody that's listening right now, if you look through those photos, please let me know if you know somebody or if I was in a city meeting people with my artwork because I think it'd be really cool to hear from you because I, I want to connect with people in more ways than just me going out. I want I want people to, to have feedback. So yeah, they can see it on Instagram or if you put my full name, I know most people call me by my last name, but if you put Ron Blake Phoenix um, in a Google search, there's going to be so much that comes up. There's a documentary that these students at Arizona State University did they followed me for about four months and they actually got nominated for an Emmy award for their documentary. So they did an amazing job. They share the journey that I've been on. 
it was in the early days. So I looked about seven years. Well, I was seven years younger. So <laughs> I was a little bit more youthful and vibrant. Um, but it's, I again, I think that there's a takeaway in that that film they created because, well, I, I just, I don't want to give it away. Um, it's, you guys will see. And, and the fact that they got nominated for an Emmy Award shows that they really put a lot of effort into it. And so many years have passed. They were all about 20 years old. My understanding is two of them are married now. I was just in touch with them recently. One of them is in law school. Gosh, I mean, they're pushing their late 20s now. So it's just so weird to see how life progresses. But anyway, those would be some good opportunities for people to have those takeaways to, to look up stuff. And the TEDx talk I gave um, should pop up somewhere on that Google search. So um, yeah. I think those would be, and then just a lot of news stories. If I was close to your city, you can read. Um, I, I did a guest commentary that was on USA Today this past year, a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that was for all the male listeners. I think that would be a powerful piece to, to see the one in USA Today because a lot of men and boys, we... We're not at all encouraged to talk about our sexual abuse or violence we go through. We are, I mean, I, it's not easy from my understanding for a woman or a girl to go through that. It's not easy for anybody. The problem with us guys is there's a stigma and we're just told to keep quiet and just move on. Yeah. But you, know, you, you can't. So the hope is maybe some of the guys listening can find that USA Today piece I wrote in April this year. And it was really specifically targeted to us to the guys to speak out yes so ho hopefully that helps um what people can see and what they can find and what could be um beneficial for for them to engage with perfect perfect well ron it's been definitely a pleasure having you as a guest on our show thank you very much for sharing your story well thank you i appreciate you um letting me share um every time i talk about my story um, like what happened to me and I share the journey that I've been on with all these people, it's helpful because uh, Cleone, eight years ago, I wasn't doing any of this. So what you've done, you've given me a chance to share. And then hopefully, Cleone, what you've also done is people that are listening, if they've been through something similar to me and they've never spoken out, maybe what you've done is you've allowed them to find their voice today. And so um, to you, Cleone, thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And to all your resilient minds out there until next time, please subscribe to us on all our platforms and don't forget to rate the show and leave a review for us on Apple podcasts. Also join the community of resilient minds and sign up for our monthly newsletter at clunycrawford.com. Be sure to grab a copy of my book, the music of my life on all on Amazon marketplaces to get to know me better. If you can think of one person that will receive value from today's show, or connect with Ron's testimonial, please share it with them. Feel free to take a screenshot of this week's episode of the podcast and tag us on Instagram. You can tag myself at OnlyCleone or Resilient Minds 365 and today's guest at, uh, I believe it's Blake Lake Show. Yeah, Blake Lake Show. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and remember, mental health is not a death sentence. Despite your illness, you can strive, thrive, and live a life of abundance. Until next time, I'm Cleone Crawford, and I'm signing off.